Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. Okay, good morning. Not sure what was wrong with my microphone, but it's fixed now. So that's good. Let's begin with prayer. Father, thank you for all that you do for us. We love you, and, and our desire is to be agents of change here in, in our society. The only way we can do that is through the gospel. And so that's our, our aim, is to, to gather people to you, to evangelize, to talk to the world about you. And, and that's what we're focused on this morning, Father is how do we do that in our own context. So thank you, Father, for, for men like Ken Ham and, and the, the other teachers and, and uh, leaders at Answers in Genesis and all the various uh, apologetics ministries that have uh, poured into this kind of material. Thank you for the blessing of being yours and being together in, in fellowship. We trust that you would be honored by everything that we do and say. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, this is my, I think my favorite um, of the lessons because of the approach. And I, th those of you that have known me for a while will understand when you, uh, we're going to listen to Ken Ham talk in, in a little bit. And I think you'll, uh, you'll recognize why this becomes my favorite. We're talking about the gospel and cultural context. By cultural context, what we mean is, how do you talk to the people around you? Because our culture is different here today than, than when Scripture was written, and even, even different than where Scripture was written, even if we're talking today. So our, cul our, our cultural context, that was, that was easy for me to say. So the, uh, the lesson focus is there's only one gospel, but we need to understand how to communicate it to our context. This is what I appreciate so much about Answers in Genesis ministry. It's not just an apologetics ministry. It's an apologetics ministry with the aim of sh sharing the gospel. That's why it's answers in Genesis. You can begin in your study of Scripture in Genesis and begin to see the answers. And I appreciate the heart that Ken Ham has on, on seeing it that way. So there's only one gospel, but we need to understand how to communicate it in our context. As a result of this lesson, students will be able to, that's you, be able to Classify a given context as an Acts 2 culture or an Acts 17 culture. Acts 2 or Acts 17? Anybody want to hazard a, a guess? Maybe even a knowledgeable guess as what the difference are or is? Differences are? Difference is? Okay, Jewish, well, Jewish people, yeah. Jewish people. Uh -huh. Acts 17, um, anybody. Gentiles. Specifically Athens. Athens, Greek. Yeah, so in Acts 2, Acts 17, that's correct. So Acts 2 is, is Peter talking to the Jews who already have a basis of knowing who God is. They already have a basis of understanding to an extent salvation and atonement and so forth and one singular god they're monotheists act 17 what is it that paul discovered when he walks downtown athens the other unknown god well let me introduce you to the unknown god one of many so the whole context is different when you're talking to polytheists and in the in the lecture that we're going to see uh, ken ham give this morning he dives into this and really explains it really well. I, this is one of the most uh, important lessons we could, we could learn. 
We're also going to identify the vital elements of the gospel. What are the things that we got to tell people? And discuss the role of context when approaching evangelism. Those are our objectives. This morning, uh, in Observe It, understand what the Acts 2 approach is, and then what the Acts 17 approach is. We'll have lots of time to discuss. I think this uh, lecture is about 22 minutes. So, any questions before we go on? Okay, here's Ken Ham um, about the gospel in context. Whoops. There's, there's only one gospel, but we need to understand how to communicate it in our context. 1 Corinthians 1, 23. We read this. We preach Christ crucified under the Jews a stumbling block, but under the Greeks foolishness. I want to look at some big picture aspects here tonight regarding the preaching of the gospel. The preaching of the cross was foolishness to the Greeks, but what to the Jews? Stumbling block. What to the Greeks? Foolishness. I want to look at this in a particular way. We're going to look at two sermons. Two sermons where the gospel was preached, number one to the Jews, number two to the Greeks. I want to look at those, Peter taking the gospel to the Jews, Paul taking the gospel to the Greeks. I want to stand back, look at it from a big picture perspective and apply it to our culture in this era of history. And you know, when I do that, I have people afterwards who tell me, it was like a light bulb going off my head and I, and I sat there and thought, how come we've never seen this before and it's so obvious? When we go to Acts chapter 2, we have Peter here on the day of Pentecost preaching a very powerful sermon. But you can imagine, you know, he's very bold. You can imagine maybe standing on the temple steps or whatever as, as they're coming. And, and basically what he said was this, to paraphrase it. You crucified the Son of God. You nailed the Messiah on the cross. You need to repent of your sin. Look what you've done. And God raised him from the dead. And you know, when they heard this, as we read in Acts 2, they were cut to the heart and said, you know, what, what shall we do? And Peter went on to say, repent and so on. And you know what happened? The Bible uh, tells us when, when they were told to be saved and so on, that 3,000 souls were saved. And you say, wow, wouldn't I like to see a crusade like that in my area uh, this week? We used to see crusades like that. We used to see evangelistic campaigns like that. We, we, we've seen great revivals in America, in, in the East in the past, and other places. There's been great revivals in the past. Over in England and, and, and across the United Kingdom and other places of Europe, there's been times where there's been great revivals. But people, we don't see those sort of things today. In fact, I also suggest this to you. Even some of the big evangelistic crusades of the past where, where thousands were, were truly converted and they touched the cultures that, that, uh, that they were ministering to, we don't see the same sort of responses today. In fact, most of those who go to such evangelistic crusades already have a church background. Many of those who go forward are for recommitment. It's a different sort of response today. So here's what we have to ask ourselves. Oda, okay, so Peter preached... This message of the gospel, I call it the Acts 2 approach to evangelism. And I want to say this. I would suggest to you that most of what we do in our churches today, our evangelistic campaigns, even our Easter pageants, Christmas pageants, our Sunday school material, Bible study material, youth group material, whatever it is, is basically an Acts 2 approach to evangelism. And what was this Acts 2 approach? Who was Peter really preaching to? Well, he was preaching to mainly Jews or those convinced of or very familiar with the Jewish religion. Let me ask you a question. At that stage in their history... Did they believe in God? When Peter said to that group of people, God, did he have to define God or could he assume they were thinking of the God of creation, the God that he uh, understood? He didn't have to define God, did he? If he said sin, you're, you're sinners, did he have to define sin? They had the law of Moses. They knew what sin was. Sin was idolatry, taking the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Sin was stealing, murder, adultery. They knew what sin was. They didn't have a problem with the foundational knowledge. They didn't have a problem with that history in Genesis. They believed in Adam and Eve and the fall, by and large. They had the right starting point, which put them on the right road, but their stumbling block was the message of the cross. And I like to put it this way. Peter was preaching to people who already had a foundation to understand the gospel. It'd be like coming in to build a beautiful auditorium like this and somebody already put the foundation there. I remember when they were building the Creation Museum and it was just a piece of property first of all and then they seemed to spend months 
I don't know what they were doing. They were digging holes and having fun. They were laying the foundation. I thought, this is going to take forever. And suddenly one day I went there, and the day before I didn't see anything above ground, and then that day I suddenly saw all the steel structure going up. Once the foundation's there, the structure can go up very quickly. Peter was coming into a group that had the foundation. So from a human perspective, he didn't have to deal with the foundational aspects. He had to deal with the structure that Jesus is the Messiah. To me, that's analogous to this. In 1959, when I was a little boy, very little boy, very, 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 very little boy, in 1959 in Australia, a very famous evangelist came to Australia. What was his name? Billy Graham. Now, again, I'm only talking about this from a perspective of history. I know that people can have different theological views and different issues and so on, but this is from a perspective of history. There is no doubt in Australia's history, it's, it's said that those early crusades in 59 in Sydney and Melbourne that attracted thousands and thousands of people actually touched the culture in a way that's never happened since. In fact, it's been said this is the closest Australia ever came to revival. Australia's never had revival. I mean, I know that Americans pride themselves on the fact that their founding fathers had great convictions. I tell people our founding fathers had great convictions. Um, but they were convictions of a different sort, and they even went to jail for their convictions, if you can understand that. But you see, what was his message? It was mainly an Acts 2 message. It was sort of, if you like, a simple, basic presentation of the power and the hope of the gospel. You're a sinner, trust in Jesus. He died on the cross for you. You need to put your faith and trust in him. And you know what? People were truly converted. He came back and did some other crusades and so on. But you know what's interesting? Those sorts of crusades today don't touch the culture in Australia. In fact, even if they have such, most of those who go forward are already for, just for recommitment. Why was there such a difference in 1959 and the early 60s than today? You know, when I was... A little boy back then went to school. My father was a principal of schools in Australia. And at that stage in our history, they had prayer on assembly before they went in to the classroom, and they even recited the Lord's Prayer, so we knew we were praying to the God of the Bible. See, Australia inherited the British system, and so we, we built our morality on the Bible, even though it wasn't a Christian nation. Not only that, but the teachers would read through the Bible during the year. So all the students would get to hear about Adam and Eve and sin and hear about the Israelites and hear about Jesus on the cross, the babe in a manger and so on. Here's what I want to suggest to us. Back in the 50s, 60s, Australia was an Acts 2 type culture, so an Acts 2 approach to evangelism from a human perspective, it works. People understood. But if you go to Australia today, it's like America, England, Europe. Creation is basically thrown out of the schools. He used to teach creation in the schools in Australia. The Bible, by and large, has been eliminated from the schools. They, they don't have Bible readings like they used to. They don't have prayer and assembly like they used to. In fact, back in the 50s and 60s, if you said to students in Australia, God, most would think the God of the Bible. But if you say God today, it's which God? You mean a Muslim God, a Hindu God, a Shinto God, a Buddhist concept of God, a New Age God? What God are you talking about? It's a different culture. I suggest to you that an Acts 2 approach doesn't work in Australia now like it used to generations ago because Australia is no longer an Acts 2 culture. Australia, I believe, has become an Acts 17 culture. When Paul went to Mars Hill, Athens, and he met there with the Greek philosophers, the Epicureans and the Stoics, and he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection, what was the response? Huh? What, 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 what does this babbler want to say? What is this all about? The response was foolishness. Remember, the preaching of the cross was what to the Jews? A stumbling block. But what to the Greeks? Foolishness. Why the difference? Well, you have to understand, who was he preaching to? Well, the Greek philosophers here, well, what did they believe? Actually, the Epicureans, they believed that everything evolved from the earth, that sensuous pleasure was the chief good of existence and so on. They were evolutionists. See, Darwin didn't invent the idea of evolution. He popularized a particular view of it. The Greeks believed in many gods, and the gods evolved, and we evolved. The Stoics were pantheists. Pantheism is another form of evolutionism. You know what that reminded me of when I went to Japan? I've been to Japan a couple of times, and the first time I went to Japan, 
My Japanese translator sat down with me and he said, look, when you say the word God, I can't just translate it as God because over here with their Shinto religion and many gods, they'll just see it as another God like all their other gods. I'm going to have to define who God is and define the God of, of, of the Bible. God that made all things and upholds all things by the power of his word and, and separate from the creation and so on. I thought, man, these are going to be long lectures. And then he said, if you tell them they're sinners, how will they know what that is? This is not a Christian country. It hasn't had a Christian basis. Also, evolution is taught as fact in the schools, just like it is, you know, all around the world. The problem is they don't have that foundation in God's word. They don't have that history in Genesis. They will not understand. And this is what he said to me. Unless you start at the beginning and define all your terms, they will not understand. See, I was going to a culture that had no foundation to understand the gospel. Here's what... I want us to think about generations ago our western world was primarily an acts 2 type culture one way or another and so evangelists could come in and preach the message of the cross and people would understand people i want to jump ahead a little here but america used to be an acts 2 type culture and one of the problems we've got is today some of the older generation in the church grew up in more of an Acts 2 type culture, which is why they don't understand what's happening nor the approach that's needed. You see, for some of the older generation, to them, when they grew up in more of an Acts 2 type Christianized culture, and they might have believed in evolution of millions of years, but they're truly Christian, trusting in Christ. It didn't affect their salvation. And so here we are today, and we're saying, you've got to understand something. It didn't affect your salvation, but you know what it did affect? How the next generation views Scripture. And they don't understand what's happened. They were a part of helping the change of the foundation. Maybe unwittingly in many instances. America used to be an Acts 2 type culture. Creation in the school, Bible in the school, prayer in the school. A lot of kids went to church programs. And so you could come in and say, you sinner, repent of your sin. You talk, talk about God, they would hear the God of the Bible. But people, America has changed. Like the whole Western world has changed. It, it's, it's no longer an Acts 2 culture. It's increasingly what? An Acts 17 culture. It's thrown creation, Bible, prayer out of the public schools. You say, like in Australia, you say in America now to the public school students, God, which God? A Muslim God? Buddhist God? Hindu God? Which God? Years ago, generations ago, you said God, people would automatically think, even in the public schools, the God of the Bible. And see, when you compare those two different starting points, a creation-based culture, they understand the terms. Evolution-based culture, don't understand the terms. To one, the message of the cross is a stumbling block. But to the other, it's foolishness. We have to understand something. The Greeks were on a whole different road, a whole different starting point. A whole different worldview. That road does not lead up to the message of the cross. And if you want that Greek to understand the message of the cross, you realize you've got to do something. You've got to get him off the wrong road and give him a whole new starting point, give him the, the, the right history, the right foundation, to get him on the right road that will lead up to the message of the cross. Do you know that's exactly what Paul did? Oh, it's phenomenal. It's all there. He looked around, I perceive you're a very religious culture, and so it's all their, their gods and, 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 and their temples. When I was over in the British Museum in London, one of the things I wanted to do was go in there and get a picture of the Greek gods. Here they are, the Greek gods. They're not very powerful, they couldn't even get out of the case. <laughs> There's the Greek gods. And so here's Paul, and he looks around, I was passing through and found this altar with the inscription to the unknown God, Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I'm going to proclaim to you. I'm going to tell you who this one is. He is the real God. He is the God that made the world. He's the creator. He doesn't need things like your gods. Your gods dwell in temples made with hands. No, no, not the real God. He defined God. Oh, reminded me of my Japanese translator. And he made of one blood. You're all related because Paul understood that history. You'll go back to Adam and Eve. That's why we're all sinners. He was laying the foundation. You know what that reminds me of? 
Reminds me of a mission organization called New Tribes Mission. How many of you have heard of New Tribes Mission? They've developed a chronological approach to teaching because they found when they went into a pagan culture and did what most missionary colleges, Bible colleges, seminaries tell people to do today, train our missionaries here in America to do, train our pastors to do. Oh, you start in the New Testament with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and so on, and you tell them about Jesus and just go right in there and boldly proclaim Christ. They thought they had all these responses to when they actually carefully looked at it and analyzed it, they found out those natives didn't have a clue what they were doing, they just did what the missionaries wanted them to do. So then they realized they had to have a different approach, so they did something so radical it'll blow you off your seats. They decided to start at the beginning. What a concept! And they decided to present the gospel the way God does it in the Bible. Well, who would have ever thought of that idea? You know, when you buy a book, to read, what do you do? You just read the last chapter. Who cares about the rest of the book? You rent a movie to watch a murder mystery like Sherlock Holmes. What do you do? You go straight to the end to see who done it. What's the point of watching the rest? You say, that's stupid. You've got to start at the beginning. Oh, why is it most Christians in our churches today read the Bible starting at the end? We're more concerned about the end things, by the way, than we are about the beginning, and yet it's the beginning where we've lost biblical authority in our culture and in our church. See, what Paul was doing in Acts 17 was taking them off that wrong road, giving them a whole new beginning, the right start. When Paul did this, then what did he do? Then he presented the Acts 2 message, the message of the cross. Talked about the resurrection. And look what happened. Three different responses. Some mocked like last time, but some said, we'll hear you again. Their hearts were opened and some believed. Wow. Now, here's the thing that really burdens me. I look at that and I say, that is incredible. Paul was going to outright pagans and some were converted. When we had 300 atheists as one group come to the Creation Museum, we knew you weren't going to get mass conversions on that day because <laughs> we, we understand the nature of who they are. But you know what? They heard God's word and they heard the gospel and we don't know how God will work on their hearts and minds, but it's so difficult to, to, to minister to those people. They're so hardened. And they actively suppress the truth and unrighteousness. It's, they're very difficult to witness to. Wow! Paul saw conversions. God, obviously, is the one that opened their heart and raised them from the dead. I say that to you for this reason. Do you know what many seminary professors, Bible college professors in this nation tell their students? I've heard it myself. And in fact, not that long ago, I picked up a little devotional booklet that's printed for a particular group of churches. Um, and I found this one in the Michigan area, actually, for some of the Reformed churches. Oh, and I read one of the devotions. And I just felt like crying. Look what it says. Paul came to Corinth speaking the gospel in simple terms. He had just journeyed there from Athens where he had drawn on his education to try to communicate the gospel in the style of a philosopher. The result, the great missionary fell flat on his face. I can picture him entering into his diary. Don't ever try this again. The cross doesn't need my verbal decorations. Oh, Paul was so unsuccessful. People, that's what some seminary professors are telling students in America. Don't use a method Paul used in Acts 17. He didn't get many responses. Use a method in Acts 2. The method in Acts 2 requires an Acts 2 type culture to understand it. Paul was phenomenally successful. Do you know what Paul had to do? Using the terms Greeks and Jews as types, he had to turn Greeks into Jews. He was preaching people who had the wrong foundation. He had to take out the wrong foundation. It was like coming in to build a building like this. Somebody put the foundation there. It was the wrong one. We're going to dig it all up and start all over again. It's a much more difficult task. So you start to think about this. Generations ago, when America was more like the Jews, our whole Western world was to one degree or another, preached the message of the cross, people by and large would understand. But you come into the present world where our culture is much more like the Greeks. Whole generations brought up in an education system devoid of the knowledge of God. If anything, Christianity, the Bible is taught against, mocked, scoffed, openly mocked in our culture. They're taught about many gods, and you preach the message of the cross and it's foolishness under them. Remember from one of the other sessions where I quoted President Obama. And one of the mantras of President Obama in 2009, 2010, 
Whatever we once were, we are no longer. We're no longer just a Christian nation. We're also a Jewish nation, a Muslim nation, a Buddhist nation, a Hindu nation, a nation of non-believers. We know that the president is saying we no longer build our thinking on the Bible. We have a different starting point because he defines marriage as you can have it between a man and a man, a woman and a woman, and he, he actually declares that we need to support that. So we know what he's saying. There's a change. But what he's really saying too, it's a change from one God to many gods. In fact, in Newsweek, April 2009, in the article in Newsweek that we had on the front cover, The Decline and Fall of Christian America, they made this statement. The present in this sense is less about the death of God and more about the birth of many gods. Do you know what they're really saying? Whatever we once were, we no, no longer. It was one nation under God, but now it's many gods. We're no longer an Acts 2 culture, we're an Acts 17 culture. Whole generations of kids now are going to the Greek schools. They throw in God, the Bible, prayer out. They threw Christianity out, replaced it with the religion of naturalism. 90% of kids from church homes go to the Greek schools. And the Jews, if you like, as types from our churches are being turned into Greeks. And yet, what we're doing as a church through our Sunday school literature, Bible study literature, evangelistic campaigns, our Bible tracts that we have, our Easter pageants, Christmas pageants, through most of our thrust as a church, we're not approaching them as Greeks, we're approaching them as what? Jews. That's why I've said over and over again, we have a problem. A lot of our Sunday school literature, youth group literature, Bible study literature, we teach Bible stories. All these wonderful stories in the Bible, but they go to a Greek education system, most of them, where they're taught, here's the real history of the world, millions of years, evolution, Big Bang, the Bible's not true, never was a global flood. They're being turned into Greeks, and instead of teaching them how to defend their faith, giving them answers, teaching the Bible as a real book of history that connects to reality, giving them that history, making sure they've got the right foundation, their hearts and minds are being captured by the Greeks. Turned into Greeks. And we keep approaching them as Jews and wonder why we're losing them. You know, 1 Peter 3.15, always be prepared to give a defense or to give an answer. We're not teaching apologetics. The Greeks are teaching our kids apologetics. They're teaching them, here's the reasons to believe in millions of years. Here's the reasons to believe in evolution. Here's all the reasons the Bible's not true. What do we do? Here's his stories, trust in Jesus. The Greeks are changing their foundation from God's word to man's word. And what are we doing? Oh, that's okay. You can believe in that. Trust in Jesus. You know what the Creation Museum and the Answers in Genesis ministry is all about? It's actually to take Greeks and turn them into Jews. It's to de-Greekize them. You might say, there's no word de-Greekize. So what? I made it up. I like that word. Here's what's happened. Generations of our kids, our whole culture, all of us have been Greekized and we need to de-Greekize. We need to be taking people off the wrong road and giving them the right starting point, putting them on the right road so they'll understand the message of the cross. And people, it's got to start in our homes. It's got to start in our churches. It ends abruptly. I'm sorry about that. Questions, comments? Really? It makes total sense. It makes total sense. Yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I really appreciate his heart in this. He wrote a book, already gone, probably five, six years ago, maybe even more than that, where he really del delves into this topic, where he talks about the kids that we have in churches that are already gone, they're already lost because they are so impacted by what the, what the school systems today teach that it's not that we have to prevent them from going. We've already lost them. We've got to get them back. 
Um, that's one reason we homeschooled, and I'm really glad that Kate and Brian have decided they're going to homeschool Harper, because there is so much garbage out there in the world that that it's so hard to fight against. And one of the things that that Ken Ham says frequently, he he started, he he didn't go as far as we've seen him go, but he he talks about all the things that churches fail to do while at the same time telling them to trust Jesus. You know, kid goes to, goes to school and is taught about the billions of years and how that doesn't fit with what Scripture says. Well, don't worry about that, but trust Jesus. In other words, what we're doing by the way we teach our children, we being the United States, teach our children is don't be concerned about the truth of the Bible, but trust Jesus. See, those are contrary things. Exactly. Exactly. So I really appreciate uh, the way he put this together. Um, the Acts 2 and the Acts 17. Uh, Acts 2, uh, of course, being, being Jews. He, he was not saying that in order to be saved, you have to become a Jew. He was using that as a type of people that are, are focused on... or recognize who God is with the exception of Brian we all can remember when in, you know in the 60s when when we said prayer in school even even in you know in uh, in the early 70s in high school that wasn't a problem but today you can't do that today you can't even have a Bible study club in school but but a Satan's club can right um, because of the fear that has been introduced. And so the, the, what he's telling us, and, and what I think we can all observe, is the world today has gone to a place where, where they don't have the foundation that we expect. Just look at how many churches operate in that Greek concept and do things on that level rather than operating on a, on, a, on a foundation of Scripture, on a foundation of, of one true God. I think it's very important for us to, uh, to see these differences. Questions? Our church um, as a country, I mean, it, it would be like trying to, uh, as soon as someone walks in the door, teach them about Revelation. Yeah. I mean, there's no starting point. So, I mean, no wonder people are confused. Because as soon as you start trying to confuse people, they're like, nope, I'm out. Well, even, even people of my generation, they don't really, most of them have been brainwashed right. by the media that they don't, they no longer have that foundation that we, we got in school. Or how how did America, how did the West, probably a better way to say it, get to this point? Colleges. Okay, colleges, yeah, they certainly contributed to it. What had, a, what had, well, I can't talk today. What had to happen before the colleges would start the process of, as, as Ken would say, Greekify? Took prayer out of school. Churches stopped actually speaking up on the topics that needed to be said. That's right. We abdicated our role. It used to be that guys went to, to, to seminary and got a degree in theology. They were looked at as having obtained the highest de degree. Theology used to be the queen of the sciences. And now it's not even considered a, a legitimate degree. They're, they all started as seminaries. It used to be that there was a foundation, and then the church started backing up from that. Uh huh. That's correct. Just this y yesterday, 
at the United Church of Christ in Naples. They had a great big LGBTQ thing. And, and I didn't know a whole lot about Church of Christ, so I, I uh, did a little research and I started reading their, uh, their statement of faith, which if you only read their statement of faith, you would think, okay, this is not so bad. But then when you read their statement of practice, their social, their social warrior campaigns is what they're... Everything's about social justice. That's a key word that we should, we should recognize, or a key phrase. It doesn't mean what you think it means. It means that what we teach in Scripture is wrong. Everybody has the right to have their own idea. That's the problem that we face today is we the church has abdicated the role of saying this is what god says this is what's really true and now everybody can say well that's your truth but my truth there is no such thing as your truth and my truth there's only god's truth the truth you're not entitled to your facts though Correct. We are way, I mean, we have even taken this step farther. Correct. I, I read a, a short book by John MacArthur last night. The, the church, in our lifetime, we have seen the church go from, from the modern era to the postmodern, and now we're past that. We're now to the era when, and I forget what he called it, um, where, where no longer can there be a defined truth. So that means if I say that God says, or Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father but my, by me, then no longer can that be an acceptable statement because it has to take into account everybody's truth. My truth, your truth. But there can't, there can't be many But that's a definitive statement that you can't make. Yeah. See, they, they, they've, they've got us in that because a hundred years ago, the church has abdicated their role to be the moral counsel to the, to the nation, and now we don't have the right to speak up. We've, we've lost the ground, and we have to go back and begin this all over again. This is not new, by the way. The world has been through this before. We're just experiencing it for our first time. The Apostle Paul writes to the... Uh, oh, I wish I could read these little words. The Apostle Paul writes to the, uh, to the Romans, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Notice what he's saying there, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For it is the righteousness of God revealed from faith for faith, as it was written, righteousness shall live by, the righteous shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. The truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they were without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking, and foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the, of, uh, the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. That's what, that what, that's what Paul explains afterwards. Um, though they knew God, um, for what can be known about God is plain to them. How do we know about God apart from Scripture? Nature. Nature. Creation. We all are created in a way that it's unexplainable apart 
from a, a, in philosophical terms, an uncaused first cause. That's God, an uncaused first cause. And, and nature says that. And if you look at, at all of, the, of the, the people that are out there, especially secularists that are out there talking about where did we come from, they all get to a point and then they can't go any further without faith. And where's faith come from? Faith comes from God. So the Apostle Paul here is, t- is telling us about the Romans <coughs> who, who recognize creation but fail to recognize the Creator. And Paul says, look, it's clear to us all. But we suppress it. We're now in a phase where the world is suppressing the truth. Paul was in a phase, or the world was in a phase when Paul was writing, of suppressing the truth. It's possible to turn around. Whether or not we get to see it, whether or not we get to participate in it, I don't know. But it is possible. What we're going through in the world today is not new. Satan keeps using the the tricks that he likes that work. Other questions, comments? This is why I focus so much on this stuff. Because we need to be the ones that, that... regain the foothold to be able to say these things to the to the world in the book that i was reading it's a 39 page book from uh, macarthur i forget the name of it off the top of my head but it's he's he's talking about how we have the responsibility to again say to the world this is what is true now, the, the world is saying, well, you've got to be tolerant. But see, they can't be tolerant of us because we have, we have claimed a truth that is defined by God that they can't accept because it's, it's anathema to what they believe. And so tolerance does not extend to biblical Christians just because it would prove them to be wrong. Other comments, questions? Okay. Get extra coffee this morning. Father, thank you for for Ken Ham's discussion of of the Jewish mind of the day and the Greek mind of the day. Lord, let us uh, let us recognize those contexts, those cultures in our own context. The Greek mind, of course, would be the, the world that we find ourselves in today that has no basis for understanding of uh, truth, of specific defined truth, not relative truth. Remind us who you are every day. Thank you that you are sovereign. None of this is a surprise to you. That gives me so much comfort every day. You're you're sovereign. You're in control. This is not something that you haven't seen before. And you called us to be lighthouses, to gather folks to, to you in light of what this world is like. So that might mean talking about things that people are uncomfortable with so that they recognize you as the creator. Thank you, Father. Give us a great time in the service to follow that you might be honored and glorified as we worship you through fellowship and through music and through study. In Jesus' name. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.